Well, to discuss those stories a bit further, and I joined Mr. James Corbett, who is the editor of the CorbettReport.com, and he is joining us live now from Osaka. Mr. Corbett, thanks very much for joining us here on Press TV. Now, I'm trying to understand this, this coalition that has been formed to fight ISIL. Um, it comes off as a bit hypocritical, does it not, considering many of these countries are at least um, you know, accused of being complicit, at the least, in the very formation of ISIL to begin with. Well, that's an extremely important point, and I think it goes to the core hypocrisy of what is going on here. And I think it would be uh, very disingenuous to argue that that these countries, and especially, of course, the United States, are somehow the uh, the neutral outside observers who are going to be able to to form some sort of coalition against the very group that they helped train. And this goes back to as far as 2006, when uh, ISIL was Al Qaeda in Iraq, and uh, declassified documents uh, that were published by the Washington Post confirmed that internal Pentagon documents actually referred to al-Qaeda in Iraq as a PSYOP operation that the Pentagon participated in, trying to build up this organization and make it seem more important than it really was in order to justify the American military uh, ongoing, at that time, intervention in Iraq. Fast forward six years to 2012, and you had the, uh, the then secret, but now, now confirmed, a Jordanian military base that was being used by the U.S. and others to train some of the militants who went on to form ISIS and become part of that group. So again, we have this ongoing situation where the very groups that have been fostered, funded, equipped, trained, armed, and otherwise aided by these very countries are now being used as a justification for these countries to, to invade and to bomb uh, Iraq and Syria. So what, what exactly is the game plan then here? Is it just more war for war's sake? Well, I think a lot of different uh, players at the table have different reasons for wanting this type of intervention, and I think we can look at such things as the uh, the, the very important northern Syrian corridor that is a, a planned and proposed gas uh, pipeline route uh, up through Turkey and towards Europe as a way of feeding Arabian gas up into into Europe as a way of uh, getting around Gazprom's uh, reliance or the Europe's reliance on Gazprom, I should say. But uh, I mean, that's just one potential uh, reason why this is a, a very geostrategically important region. So I think there are a lot of different interests and different players who have different reasons for wanting this intervention. But I think it all converges on this northern Syria and, uh, and Iraq area. And, and when it comes to the crucial issue of Syria, obviously, um, you know, the Syrian government as well as Russia have made it clear that they want consent and coordination with the Syrian government for anything that happens within Syria's borders against ISIL. Uh, do you think that is likely to occur at any point? Well, it seems extremely unlikely, and especially because this doesn't really seem like this is some sort of brand new strategy from this coalition that America seems to be forming right now. It seems like this is just a, co a continuation or, or an actual uh, uh, bringing about of the, the plans for uh, armed intervention in Syria that, that uh, were being talked about last year but didn't actually happen. Well, it seems like they're happening now, and it has been uh, explicitly mentioned by Obama that part of this is going to be continuing uh, America's efforts to destabilize the Assad government. So I don't imagine there's going to be much consultation taking place. And, and talking about this, this Frankenstein, if I may call it that, of ISIL, uh, which, which uh, the U.S. as well has been complicit in informing, uh, because we've seen U.S. weapons, even pictures of U.S. weapons being used by these terrorists on the ground. How much of a risk now uh, is this group to the U.S. itself? Well, it certainly does pose uh, various types of risks in the region, but as you say, I think we have to look at where this was, uh, how it was founded and where the, it's been supplied and where the equipment and money has been flowing from. And of course, that raises the other side of the equation, which is if it does stop that type of, uh, if that sort of outside support is stopped, does it really have the ability to function to control the area that it is now seeking to control? And I think that the answer is, uh, is a resounding no. It, it couldn't have been built up, and I don't think it can be maintained or sustained without the outside support that it's been receiving from, from the U.S. and its allies in the Gulf region. But then many people, um, if, if I may argue that point, Mr. Corbett, uh, many people say that it doesn't even need outside funding anymore, uh, considering it can extort people, it can kidnap people for ransom, et cetera, et cetera, and has a lot of resources now at its, at its fingertips and in, in the regions which it controls. So then um, uh, how do you respond to that? 
Well, I think that first of all, the the number of uh, fighters that this group claims to uh, to have is a highly disputed number, and I think one that ha has been again blown up in the same way that uh, Al Qaeda in Iraq was being blown up blown up in 2006 to make it seem more important than it really was. I think there's been a, a lot of overinflation of some of the uh, the estimates of the fighters, and in terms of the uh, the, the the ability for this group to maintain and, and sustain and fund itself uh, through such things as extortion and ransom money and things like that. Well, it's important to realize that, again, that can't take place without the cooperation of the governments which are giving them this uh, ransom money. So, uh, again, I think there's a way that we can see that a lot of this is still coming from one, one measure or another of outside support. And without that support, it would at least have a significantly degraded ability to, to do anything at all. Okay, and on that note, we'll leave it there for now. But, of course, we do appreciate you speaking to us. So this is James Corbett, who is speaking to us live via Skype from Osaka.